Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Deborah Stellingworth is training us on how to elevate our business and life by mastering three mental muscles. Deborah, can we start with a couple of questions that will help us get to know you a little bit more personally? Definitely, thank you, Roger. All right, the first question is this. What got you interested in coaching people around stress and performance? Okay, well, I'm gonna share a little bit more about that in my talk, but I have, I am a recovering perfectionist and a recovering workaholic. And when I found myself burnt out and stressed out for the umpteenth dozen time, I decided it's time to start finding a better way. And I started researching and uh, exploring and that's what led me into coaching and um, working with that because I, there really is a better way. You, you were a realtor in your former life, weren't you? I was, and before that I was a high school English teacher. Oh my goodness, from stress to stress. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so All I know right. stress, we're well acquainted. All right, my second question is this. What do you love most about your work as a coach? Mm. I love it when I get to wake people up to possibilities and choices they didn't even realize they had so that they can step in to the fullness of what's possible for them. Because so many of us go through our lives kind of half awake. And I had somebody wake me up and now I have the wonderful blessing of being able to wake other people up to their possibilities. Beautiful. I'm looking forward to being woken up in the next little while. Audience members, if you have questions during Deborah's talk, would you type them into the chat? And then periodically during Deborah's talk, I will interrupt her and pose your questions to her. The uh, video recording of uh, Deborah's training is going to be made uh, public on YouTube later this evening, and you'll be provided with the link. It takes me about an hour to do what needs to be done in order to publish as public uh, the video. Uh, Deborah, are you ready to rock the stage? I am so ready, Roger. Thank and you. And the stage is all yours. Wow us. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to Grow Your Business and Elevate Your Life. I'm going to share with you three keys to overcome stress and increase performance. These are things that I have found work in my life and work with the clients that I work with, uh, entrepreneurs and leaders in uh, mid-level executives that I work with. Um, I would love for you to connect with me on Instagram at Deborah Stellingworth, on Facebook at The Stellar Life Project, and you can hashtag Stellar Life Project if you're commenting about um, our time here together tonight. So 2020 has been an exceptionally stressful year for so many people. Collectively, we have experienced extreme uncertainty and disruptive changes to our everyday lives. Many people have been impacted by financial hardships and emotional turmoil as a direct result of the pandemic. So last week when I was driving in my car, listening to the radio, I wasn't too surprised when I heard this sound bite. The stress can be a lot. Take a moment to yourself to breathe with Breeze 104.5. And while this is true, the stress has been a lot this year, and this is good advice to breathe. As many of you mentioned, breath work has really worked for you. We are not strangers to stress. In fact, many people have told me that they were actually relieved when the pandemic required them to slow down, in some cases come to a grinding halt, which is not that surprising considering the World Health Organization declared stress a worldwide epidemic long before we were faced with this pandemic. And while in light of a pandemic, an epidemic doesn't seem like that big of a deal, when we look at the numbers, we see just how significant that is. In a recent WHO report, World Health Organization, they said that up to 50% of doctor's visits were stress-related. I wouldn't be surprised if there are more. And 
the co estimated cost in lost wages and lost work um, due to stress-related illness and uh, productivity, the estimated cost in the US alone is $300 billion a year. That doesn't include all the other countries. So this got me wondering, what is stress costing you and me in our businesses and our lives in terms of productivity, health, relationships, income, and even happiness? Well, this evening I'm gonna share with you three keys to overcome stress and increase performance. One is to get into your zone, two, to follow your North Star, and three, to grow your mental muscles. That's the three core mentals of mental, uh, mental muscles of mental health. No, okay. So, word for word, word for word. common stressors, Time stress, money stress, perfectionism, imposter syndrome. Um, Roger, could you please mute who the participants? Because it sounds like somebody's not muted right now. The same thing. We are not productive. So can we please uh, mute everyone? Done. Sorry. Deborah, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I muted everyone, including you. Including me. Okay, I'm back. So go the, back. Go back a sentence. I'm going to go back a sentence to the common stressors. So, of the common stressors, the number one stressor that clients come to me about, the number one complaint I get, is time stress. Clients come to me because they're frustrated that they feel like they don't have enough time for themselves, enough time to do their work. And many people tell me that if they just had better time management, then everything would be okay. They would get more done and they would be able to take care of themselves better. There'd be time for meditation. There'd be time for self care and they would be more successful. Now, if that were true, the time and productivity management industries is a multi-billion dollar industry. In fact, in the app store, there's close to 1,200 apps for productivity and time management. So here's my theory, guys. If time management were really the problem, we would have solved it by now. So what got me, and I, I believe me, I've tried a lot of these. And so it got me thinking that perhaps time management isn't our problem. Perhaps time stress is a symptom, not a cause, a symptom of a greater issue. For example, the fact that we are a part of a culture where exhaustion has become a status symbol, busyness, a badge of honor. We have anxiety has become a lifestyle. And many of us, my former self included, have bought into the myth that it has to be stressful for me to be successful. Well, I have some good news for you. It is possible to slow down and stress less without sacrificing performance or success. I know because I've done it and now I get to help other people do it too. And this evening, I am so passionate to share with you what I've learned because it changes, it's changed my life and it's changed the lives of people that I work with. And one thing I know for sure about the kind of people who come to a talk like this looking for a better way is that when they find it and really integrate that into their lives, it will make an exponential difference in their businesses and their lives and have an impact on the people they care about and the people they serve. And that can only have a ripple effect to make the world a better place for all of us. So my promise to you this evening is that I will share with you as much information as I can so that you can learn to overcome stress and increase your performance. And then I'm going to show you how you can take that and turn it into lasting transformation. And if you stick with me to the end, I have a couple of gifts for you that are going to help you do that. So my request of you is that you listen for insight. You may have heard some of the things I'm going to share before, but maybe they haven't landed yet. And when we listen for insight, 
something that we've heard before lands like we've heard it for the first time and it changes us forever. I also ask that you listen with intention. When we're listening with intention, we're deciding there's gonna be something that you take from the, my talk tonight that's going to change the way you show up in the world tomorrow and for all the days that follow. So before we go any further, I think it's important for me to tell you how we got here where I'm talking to you about stress and performance. And we need to start with high-speed depth. For a long time, I have had the motto, walk fast, talk fast, do everything fast, do it faster, do more of it faster, do some more faster, and keep going faster and faster and faster. And I'm not really sure when I bought into that motto, but I can tell you it was before I was 12 years old. Because when I was 12 years old, it was the first time I was diagnosed with exhaustion. And at the time, and I used to tell that story, by the way, um, with an element of pride, which now to me seems kind of perverse. I wish I could tell you that I had um, gotten over it that first time, but I didn't. If we fast forward 30 some odd years, walking probably rather quickly on the seawall with my husband as I'm agonizing over my decision to leave my 15 year teaching career. And I was going back and forth, should I go, should I stay? I really loved my job. I was in my zone of genius. It's that sweet spot where you know you're making a difference and you're using your gifts. And so it was hard for me to talk about leaving it. And my husband interrupted me very quietly saying, I'm afraid you're going to die. And it still makes me emotional when I think of that because my, at the time, even though at the time I was like, you're being dramatic, which is unfair because my husband is the least dramatic person you will meet. And his comment made me realize that this decision wasn't just about me. And this wasn't the first time my husband had expressed concern over my workaholic tendencies. I have, have perfectionist tendencies. I am a hyperachiever, you know, and that has served me in, to a certain degree to get me some success. I was department head at a, an elite private school. I was training other teachers and I had done a master's degree full time while working full time. And I was still always looking for more things to do to prove myself to be worthy and to prove myself to be enough. And he'd been concerned about me for a while, but nothing stopped me until I had a minor car accident that, whoops, resulted in a major life change for me. I was, it was so minor, but I sustained some soft tissue damage here in my right clavicle area. And it meant that I could no longer do the physical aspects of my job. And you might wonder as an English teacher, what are the physical aspects of my job? Well, it's the handwriting. I was an international baccalaureate teacher. There was a lot of handwriting and I just couldn't do it anymore. And without pain, and I can tell you one thing for sure, other people's children are really annoying when you're in pain all the time. And I found myself becoming one of those grumpy teachers. You know the ones, we've all had them. And I just didn't wanna be that person. So that, along with my husband's concern, finally brought me to the place where I was willing to make a change. And the path I chose was real estate. Cause our realtor had said, hey, you should go into real estate. You'd be really good at it. And I was like, no thanks, I love my job. But then, the change was necessary and so I chose that route. And I did really well at it. Your average realtor does two to six deals in their first year, I did 17. I was really successful right away. And the problem with that was that with real estate, there were no breaks, at least with, um, at least with uh, teaching, sorry, I'm gonna go back here. At least with teaching, there was, built-in breaks where I had to take my summers off. I had to, I even had to take weekends. And with real estate, I was out of control. My hyperachiever perfectionist tendencies were out of control. And after five years of that, I was burnt out. I was waking up in the morning, feeling like I had to swim my way to the top 
from, you know, a thousand feet underwater. I went through my days feeling like I was just want to lay on the floor all the time. Now, if you had known me then, you wouldn't have known that I was depressed because I'm a high functioning depressed person. But I, I was burnt out. I was really unhappy and it was affecting my relationship and my health. I got diagnosed as being borderline diabetic, which made no sense at all because I am not overweight and I exercise and eat well all the time. So the only thing we could put it down to was the stress. And so I started looking for different ways of being and different ways of showing up in the world. And I really struggled to find a solution for what I was experiencing. And fortunately, I came across a book whose central question was this, how much time are you spending in your zone of genius? And I thought, oh my gosh, that's it. I'm not in my zone of genius. This is why I'm feeling so lousy. And this is why I feel like it's a struggle all the time. And that became the start of a journey that led me into coaching and led me to this place. This is the short version of the story. If you want to know more, I can tell you more another time. But I'm going to move on and share with you what I've learned and how I've moved from being in this place of stress and burnout all the time to a place where I have created a life for myself that I really love and I get to help other people do the same. So the first key I have for you for overcoming stress and increasing performance is to get into your zone. And by your zone, I mean the right zone. In his book, The Big Leap, Dr. Gay Hendricks talks about our four zones. The zone of incompetence, the zone of competence, the zone of excellence, and the zone of genius. Now, at this point, a lot of people often say to me, well, I'm not a genius, I'm not special, I don't have a zone of genius. And I wanna to say to you right now, stop that thinking because all of us do. We all have a zone of genius. It's that place where what you love to do intersects with what your unique gifts and talents are. And it's that place where you feel like you're living your purpose. Now, sometimes it's helpful to look at what is not our zone of genius to understand better what is. And we'll get to that in just a second. And I have these three questions for you. You can take a screenshot of this if you want of ways for you to identify your zone of genius. What is your unique ability? What's something you can do for long periods of time without feeling tired or bored? And what do you really love to do? Now let's look at what your zone of genius is not, and that might help you to answer the question, what is your zone of genius? So I know my zone of incompetence, when I'm in it, I feel like this. I wanna pull my hair out. Um, usually when I'm doing something to do with an Excel spreadsheet, I can use the basics of it, but I have this really gorgeous Excel spreadsheet tracker system that I had created for my business planning with my clients. Um, it's a wonderful tool. And if I break the formulas, I cannot fix it. I have somebody else who does that for me because it's super frustrating. Your zone of competence is that place where, you know, you can do the task, but you're not inspired. Your zone of excellence might be that place where you're really good at what you're doing. Like me in real estate, I was really good at it. I got lots of awards for it. I made a lot of money at it. And everybody else was like, you're so good at this. Why would you leave it? And I was like, cause I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. I'm not really feeling like I'm living my purpose. When I'm in my zone of genius, I know it because I'm happy. And the happiness leads me to success. I'm no longer chasing happiness as a result of success. I feel like I'm on a mountaintop. I'm full of energy. And I'm, the sky is open to me with so much possibility. So I have a couple of questions for you. And I ask my, all of my clients these questions when we start working together. How much time are you spending in each of these zones? And are you willing to increase the amount of time you are spending in your zone of genius? Because I guarantee you, if you move yourself out of those other three zones, incompetence, competence, and excellence even, and more into your zone of genius, your stress will decrease, your performance will increase. And now I know some entrepreneurs are like, oh, well, we have to do everything. I have to do all the things. And that's a story we tell ourselves that sometimes holds us back 
from experiencing the results you want and certainly keeps us in that place of stress. So I challenge you to find a, a way to move into more in your zone genius, even if it's just a, you know, 5% more each quarter that you're spending in your zone of genius. So when I asked my client Dot to do this, his he showed up to a coaching call after a few months of working together and said to me, I'm a hundred percent less stressed. And here's what he had to say. One of the first things Deb had me do was get clear in my zone of genius. So I could write myself a new job description as CEO of my business and my life. As a result, I was able to focus more time on the parts of my business only I can do. This meant more time to focus on my business development and more time for myself. And with this adjustment, my team and I reached our goals midway through the year, and we were able to focus on some long neglected projects that will help grow our business next, more next year. And I love that he's 100% less stressed and enjoying his life more. So the benefits of living your zone of genius, more inspiration, more impact, less stress, better results, and more fun. Who doesn't want those things? Brings us to key number two. Find your North Star. I find that so many people are busy chasing after somebody else's version of success. And that is stressful. I know because I did it. And I've seen so many other people do it. We, we're not bred, we're not taught to ask ourselves, what do I want? And so this is why it's so important for you to find your North Star and set your compass by it. Because if you don't set your compass by your North Star, you're going to be like taking a step to the West and a step to the East and maybe a couple steps back to the South and then maybe a few steps North and then you're kind of all over the place and you're not going to get the results you want. You're not going to be performing at the level you want, which causes you stress because it usually means you're not getting the income, income or impact that you're hoping for. One of my mentors says, there is a path to the completion of what you're wanting to create. And when you're not on that path, you aren't creating it. And when you're not creating it, we all know how stressful that can be. So I have four questions for you that will help you to identify and lead you towards your North Star. Question number one is the legacy. What is the lasting difference you wanna make in the world? I have one client whose goal is to found a scholarship fund. That's the legacy he wants to leave. I have two other clients who actually work in um, residential luxury property development. Um, and they're both interested in sustainability and wanting to make sure that they're on projects where they're, they're green and sustainable and they're good for the planet and they're good for communities. Myself, my legacy is called my starfish project. If you've heard the story about a um, person on the beach just throwing one starfish back at a time, that's what I feel like I do. I help one person at a time and each of those people who, when they have their lives become better and they expand to their full potential, they will inspire others to do the same. And there's a ripple effect to what I do. And that's my legacy. And I want you to imagine what your legacy would be. What's that difference that you wanna make in the world? When you're focusing on that, it keeps you going. Deborah, are you open to your first question? Absolutely. How do you find your zone of genius? Ah, well, the questions that I gave you, first of all, are some of the questions I ask my client. And finding your zone of genius is really about getting into what do you love to do, that place for what do you love to do with what you're really good at and where they intersect. So for example, I love to sing and I'm not good at it. So when those two things intersect, that is not my zone of genius. So it could be something you enjoy, but, but I love teaching and I'm really good at it. And that's the intersection. That's when I know I'm in my zone. Hope that's helpful. Thank you, no further questions. Yeah, and just a, one more thought on that is that Sometimes it takes a while to percolate and get through. And I have a whole process. You can reach out if you want to figure that out because it's, it, sometimes you can't see what your zone is because you're in it. I remember when I was younger, 
other people were recognizing that I was a teacher before I recognized it. I had a high school teacher, gym teacher, offer me a job, get me a job teaching gymnastics with a, a local leisure um, uh, community center because she recognized I was a teacher. So sometimes other people recognize it. So it might be useful to ask some other people in your life as well. Okay. So thank you. Back to finding your North Star. You've asked what your legacy is going to be. Number two is your impact. What's the daily difference you want to make? And when I was putting this together, I was thinking about a barista that I experienced, and I say experienced on purpose, when I was at Starbucks recently. It was at the drive-thru on the Terminal, uh, Terminal Avenue uh, drive-thru at Starbucks. And she was so happy and she was joking and she was making jokes over the intercom. And then she was really friendly with people. And as I waited at the window, she was just like, you know, cheering everybody up and making jokes with her, her colleagues. And she was so fun. And I said to her, wow, I really appreciate you. And you're, and you're just, your friendliness, and you're, you're, you're just making everybody happy. And she said, yeah, I really love making people happy. And that woman knew that was the impact she wanted to make on a daily basis. Question number three, freedom. What does freedom look like for you? What does it feel like? When I was in real estate, it was like wearing a too high, too tight pair of high heel shoes. They look fantastic, but man, were they uncomfortable. And so I've defined freedom for myself to be my barefoot life. I was invited recently to uh, join a leadership coaching company. And I declined because it felt like I was putting on somebody else's shoes. So I've created my life and my business to feel like my barefoot life. And th these days I'm actually literally barefoot a lot of the time. And that has to do with, you know, the circumstances, but also, you know, what I'm creating for myself in terms of adventure and how I want to feel. So number four, question to your North Star is energy. What energizes, fascinates, and motivates you? I have one client who one of his highest values is adventure. And he wants to have adventure in everything. In fact, his mission statement, he included in the mission statement we wrote for his business, adventure. And he does project management for real estate. Uh, sorry, for yeah, construction. This is the guy who motivates me. This is my one-year-old grandson, Oliver, and he inspires and energizes me to create a life where I'm time with him and where we can do adventures together. So there's your North Star. When you answer the question, your legacy, your impact, what freedom means for you and your energy, you will find the North Star of your life. And then you'll be able to stay focused on that path. Harveen, when I first started working with her, was following somebody else's path, her dad's idea of success. And she was overwhelmed and stressed all the time. And after going through this process, as well as some of the other stuff I'm about to share with you, she recently said to me, I love this more positive, successful, and stronger version of myself looking back at me, which was really, really awesome to hear. And we see her just really growing into an amazing business person who's living the life that she wants and has a really clear sense of the legacy, the impact, the what freedom is for her and what energizes her. So benefits of following your North Star, clarity, confidence, peace of mind, focus, and results. All of the things that keep you from being stressed. So that's a lot. And I know I've given you a lot and thrown a lot at you. And I'm not going to leave you hanging. There's, there's more for you in terms of um, the mental fitness and what that's going to look like for you. So you might be asking, well, what if I know my zone of genius and I found my North Star and I still find myself stressed out? I got you. Mental fitness is the key, number three, for overcoming stress and increasing performance. And many of you shared that you do have resilience rituals and practices like meditation and yoga and that's awesome and it's a part of what actually helps you to be mentally fit and one thing that we know research has shown the research i'm going to share with you is that 
20% of positive change comes from our insights. So understanding our zone of genius, understanding our North Star, and 80% comes from our mental muscles, right? And our mental fitness as we um, strengthen our positivity, okay? So have you ever wondered why you experience procrastination, perfectionism, fear of seeming selfish, imposter syndrome? Maybe you say yes when you really wanna say no. You have fear of failure or fear of success. You feel out of control. You have anxiety about not doing enough or not being enough. Do you ever feel like your thoughts are working against you? Well, that's because sometimes they are. Because your brain is not designed to make you successful. Your brain is designed to keep you safe, which actually can cause a great deal of stress. I'm going to share with you how you can overcome that. So we have a three to one, research shows this by the way, we have a three to one negative to positive thought ratio. And from an evolutionary point of view, this really served us because it was super useful for us to notice the saber toothed tigers who were lurking in the bush who were gonna have us for lunch. Where it's not so useful for us to notice the beautiful butterfly. So from an evolutionary point of view, it was good for us to be wired for threat, right? Our brains are literally wired for threat. And so we're constantly scanning the horizon for threat. And in modern times, where we're pretty less likely to get uh, confronted with a saber-toothed tiger. Our brains are still scanning for danger and finding it everywhere, even where maybe it doesn't exist. Or finding danger that it believes is life-threatening, even though it's not life-threatening. So what is mental fitness? It's your capacity to respond to life's challenges with positive rather than negative mindset. Your level of mental fitness is determined by your ratio of positive versus negative thoughts, what we call your PQ or your positive intelligence quotient. Now the work I'm gonna share with you this evening is this part is based on the research and studies of Shirzad Shamin, who's a Stanford lecturer and author of the New York Times bestseller, Positive Intelligence. This work is rooted in positive psychology, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and performance science. And I was so excited when I discovered this work several years ago, because it brings together all of the, the branches of uh, psychology and neuroscience that I was always fascinated with as a teacher, as a teacher, I was really focused on brain-based learning and the, the impact of how our brains work on our learning. And so when I was introduced to this work several years ago, it was really exciting for me. And earlier this year, when the Positive Intelligence Organization opened their doors for the first time for coaches to be certified in this model, I was super excited to be one of the first coaches in the world to get certified in the positive intelligence model and in the information that I'm going to share with you this evening. So this is so exciting to me because when we know our brains better, we have a better understanding of what drives us and what stresses us out and what motivates us. So some of the questions came up before, it's like, I don't know how to get myself to, uh, you know, be focused, or I don't know how to um, be more level in and even in my distribution of my energy, and understanding all of those things. Uh, when we understand our brains, we can master them and stress less and accomplish more. So at this point, you might be asking, isn't mental fitness just another term for resilience? And I would say to you, yes, and it's so much more. Let me share. The positive intelligence framework, there are only three core mental muscles at the root of all mental fitness. The saboteur interceptor, so intercepting the self-sabotaging thoughts. We call those saboteurs, I'll tell you why in a second. The sage, and self-command. 
our goals of mental fitness is to weaken the saboteur thoughts. So remember I told you three to one ratio, it doesn't serve us to have a three to one negative to positive thought ratio. So we want to decrease the negative thoughts and increase the positive thoughts. So we want to weaken the saboteurs, we want to grow the positive sage perspective, and we want to shorten the recovery time when we are triggering, when circumstances or people or um, thoughts trigger our stress response. So in order to understand how to intercept the saboteurs, we first need to meet them. So the saboteurs live in the region of the brain associated with survival, which is our left brain, our limbic system, and our brain stem. It's the center of rational thought, and even though some irrational stuff comes out of it, and it's motivated through negative emotions such as guilt, fear, shame, anger, anxiety. My perfectionist and hyperachiever tendencies were definitely motivated by shame and anxiety. There are 10 saboteurs and each of them triggers our stress responses in their unique ways. We all have all of the saboteurs, but we tend to have three or four that are our dominant saboteurs. And I'm going to tell you how, who they are and how you can find out what yours are. So we all have the judge. That's the universal saboteur that we all have. You may have heard of the, the idea of the inner critic. We call it the judge in the positive intelligence model because it's so much more than just criticizing ourselves. The judge criticizes ourselves, right? Criticizes others, judges others as being wrong, and judges circumstances as being outside of our control. With the pandemic, people who responded with the most amount of stress were the ones who, when we caught ourselves kind of like, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. And the pandemic itself, though, you know, it's not a great fun thing to be happening. It in itself is not bad, it just is. So the saboteurs are determined on an axis of style versus and motivation. And there are nine of them that the judge will uh, rope in to help out with uh, his evil plots to stress us out. We've got the controller, the hyperachiever, the restless, the stickler, the pleaser, and the hypervigilant, the avoider, the victim, and the hyperrational. Now, just by the names of these, I wonder how many of you have already been able to guess what your top saboteur might be. And here's how you can find it. Oh, sorry, I'm going to go back to that. So you can, you can totally find out what yours are because there is an assessment and I'm going to share that with you at the end of the talk about how you can get the, the assessment and find out what your results are. So this is my first test results. I was in coach training at the time and I was, um, I did this assessment with another coach friend of mine and we both got 10 out of 10 on hyperachiever and we high-fived each other because we're like, yes, we're awesome. We got 10 out of 10 on hyperachiever, yes. And then we read the results. And you'll notice right here, it says highly focused on external success leading to unsustainable workaholic tendencies. And then I realized, hmm, maybe hyperachiever is not such a good thing to be. And I'm happy to report and after doing this work for the last little while, uh, my hyperachiever has dropped down to number four from number one, and I'm down in the sixes. And so this stuff really works. Another saboteur is the avoider. My client, Andrew, has a high avoider saboteur. And how that plays out for him is that he focuses on positive and pleasant in an extreme way, avoiding difficult and unpleasant tasks and conflicts, which you can see when you avoid things, as you know, some of you shared before, when we avoid things, then they pile up and we get stressed out about them. So we don't wanna do that. So I don't have time to share all the saboteurs with you tonight. I'm gonna to share with you how you can get more information on that later. But I wanted to share with you the two kind of opposites, like hyperachiever and avoider, one who's trying to do everything and one who's trying to avoid everything. So you can get a flavor for, for what they do. So the benefits of knowing your saboteurs. You understand the root cause of your stress. So we may experience stress in the same way, like as in the outcome or stress responses are triggered, 
but the thoughts that come up first that cause our stress will be different depending on what our saboteurs are. And knowing that helps us to intercept them and understand when we're being hijacked by our saboteurs and our self-sabotaging thoughts. So our next muscle we wanna build is our sage. And our sage lives in the region of the brain associated with positive emotions, empathy, curiosity, creativity, intuition, and passion. There are six ways to grow your sage muscle, the sage perspective, and the five sage powers. I'm just gonna share with you the sage perspective tonight. And that's that every outcome or circumstance can be turned into a gift or opportunity. Some of you may be familiar with the story of the stallion. It's a Taoist story about the farmer and his stallion. And when the farmer, this farmer in China had this beautiful stallion, it was his prized possession, and some thieves came along and stole it. And his neighbors came to him and said, oh my gosh, it's so terrible that your special stallion was stolen. Oh, it's so bad. And the farmer said, who knows what is good and what is bad? And the neighbors were a bit surprised and scratched their heads and went away. And the next day, the stallion came back because he was a loyal stallion and he brought with him some wild mares. And the neighbors came and said, wow, this is so good. Your stallion came back and now you have all these other horses too. And the farmer just said, who knows what is good and what is bad, excuse me. And the next day, the farmer's son is trying to tame one of these mares and he gets thrown and he breaks his leg. And the neighbors come and say, oh, it's so bad. Your son broke his leg, it's so terrible. And the farmer said, who knows what is good and what is bad? And then the next day, and the neighbors went away like, oh, whatever, this guy's crazy. And the next day, the army came through town looking for all able-bodied young men. And the farmer's son couldn't go because he had a broken leg. And so the neighbors came and said, yeah, it's so good. How fortunate your son broke his leg. And the farmer said, who knows what is good and what is bad? Now we could go on with the story and on and on, but I think you get the point is that from the sage perspective, everything is a gift. Because we can ask the question, which perspective is true? Is it bad that these things happen? Or is it good that it did? Is it a gift? And the answer is, whatever you believe becomes true. I could go through my life saying that the car accident that made me change my teaching career was bad and it ruined my life. But I honestly look at it as an opportunity because I'm here tonight and I get to do this work in the world that I never even knew was such a thing when I was teaching. I didn't know coaching was a thing when I was a teacher. And now I get to do this amazing work in the world. So that's a gift for me. So the sage perspective, everything is a gift or opportunity. When we come from that perspective, we can tap into the powers of empathy, curiosity, creativity, innovation, and laser-focused action that come from the sage perspective. And finally, is the self-command muscle. When we have self-command, it's our ability to shift from saboteur thinking, that self-sabotaging thought like, oh, I'm not good enough, I have to work harder, or I need to avoid that because it's bad, and move us into the sage perspective like, ah, oh, what is the gift here? How can I be creative? And how can I take calm, clear, laser-focused action? And our self-command, some of you who already do meditation and mindfulness practices have been building the corpus callosum, which is that uh, strip of membrane between your left and right hemisphere of your brain that actually connects them and allows you to shift from the negative thinking into the positive thinking more quickly. And that's the self-command. In the positive intelligence model, we do what's called PQ reps. I'm not gonna have time to this evening to take you through a full mental fitness workout, um, but suffice it to say, there's a lot of psychosensory techniques that we use that can be used in daily life. Um, someone mentioned that she does uh, walking meditations where she's in mindfulness moments. And those are one of the things that you can do. And sometimes we think that, you know, meditation has to be this big thing that we spend hours doing, not unless you're going to be a monk. Uh, with PQ reps, there's just mindful moments of 
focus on the physical, focus on being really present and moving you out of your left brain into your right brain. And I'm gonna share with you how you can get access to information and, and an experience of actually doing PQ reps uh, when I'm finished this talk, okay? So I'm gonna share with you what Sandra had to say after doing the PQ program with me. She said, I am more in control of my thoughts and actions and I'm having more fun. When I first started working with Sandra, she was constantly being hijacked by her saboteurs. She didn't know what that was, but she understood it's a stressful way to live. And by increasing her PQ, her positive intelligence quotient, she has now just more productive, less stressed. She calls me sometimes like, this really crazy thing happened that used to stress me out. And I was like, I was just really calm. Like, yep, this stuff works. So the benefits of increasing your self-command self of being able to move from saboteur thinking of negative thoughts into this sage perspective of calm and self-empathy and creativity and curiosity, stress management, performance management, living and working with difficult people becomes easier. Work-life balance becomes a true thing. Health and wellness, your parenting gets better. Your relationship with your partners get better and you become more of your true self, more of your essence because you're not living in fear and anxiety all the time. At this point, I often get questions. Is it really possible to just shift from saboteur to sage response, even in tough challenges? The answer is yes, but the speed and depth and the shift of the shift depends on your mental muscle strength. So for those of you who are practiced at mindfulness and meditation, you'll get there quicker and you can still get there quicker. I've had a meditation practice and a, and a yoga practice with Adrian for a long time and yet when I started doing this work, it's when I've had exponential results in my ability to shift out of self-sabotaging thoughts and behaviors much more quickly. So Dr. Gabor Mate is a local Vancouver doctor who is uh, focused on stress and addiction. And he reminds us this, we may not be responsible for the world that created our minds, but we can take responsibility for the mind that creates our world. And when we move into taking care of our brains, getting to know our saboteurs and how we self-sabotage, and then taking actions to build our mental fitness so that we can be more in our sage brain from that place of wisdom, creativity, intuition, then we're taking responsibility for our mind and how we create our worlds. And we will have less stress and we will increase our performance. So this brings me to my gift for you. Well, actually, let's, let's recap. We've had three keys to overcome stress and increase performance. Make sure you're in your zone. Follow your North Star and grow your mental fitness. So I have a few gifts for you that are going to help you to identify your top three saboteurs and how they impact your performance. So um, I'm going to ask my friend Eloise is going to pop this in the chat for me is the mental fitness uh, link. So you can just click on that link. It'll take you right to a, a form that you can fill out that will give you access to the saboteur assessment. So you can discover your top three saboteurs and explore how they're impacting you. And I'm also going to give you access to the mental fitness class that I'm running tomorrow at three o'clock. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, for those of you who can't make it at three o'clock tomorrow, don't worry. There will be a recording and we'll send you the recording afterwards. And for those of you who are watching the recording of this talk after the fact, when you request your copy of the Saboteur Assessment, you will get a link to the next mental fitness class that I'm gonna be running. And in that mental fitness class, you're gonna get practical tools you can use to instantly release stress and improve performance and results. Thank you, Roger. Well, Deborah, okay. thank you very, very much. I now know what I need to do to transition from saboteur, where I spend too much time, into sage, where I should spend more time. Thank you for these uh, perspectives. Thank you for this wisdom. Uh, this is all great stuff, and I'm quite sure VBN's members and guests really benefited 
from the hour we have uh, spent with you. So I'm now going to uh, stop the recording, but uh, uh, audience, uh, do not go away. <laughs>